We're coming to the last of this chapter. Uh, Pastor Phil's prayed. We're going to be in verses 11 through 13. So if I can, I want to take verses 6 through 10. We spent several weeks on that section leading up to this ending of verses 11 through 13. So I'm going to read in verses 6 through 10 and then for a moment reflect there, come back then to verses 11 through 13. But now when Timotheus came from you unto us and brought us good tidings of your faith and charity, and that ye have good remembrance of us always, desiring greatly to see us as we also to see you, Therefore, brethren, we were comforted over you in all our affliction and distress by your faith. For now we live if ye stand fast in the Lord. For what thanks can we render to God again for you, for all the joy wherewith we joy for your sakes before our God, night and day praying exceedingly that we might see your face and might perfect that which is lacking in your faith. Well, as we walk through that <clears throat> passage, you're going to see it again this morning. It's a thread that runs throughout Thessalonians, but certainly a thread that runs uh, into this section of Scripture, that there is a desire for the family of God to be together. And that desire should be very similar to a family who's been separated for whatever reason. Uh, you've got, in our family, you know, you have the idea of kids going off to college. Sometimes you have the idea of someone taking a business trip or someone moving to another area. And when there is that separation, there is a natural inclination, natural desire of the heart when you love each other to be able to be back together again. Well, that's the desire, but coupled with that desire is a concern, a familial kind of concern, not familiar, but familial. Uh, that is a concern that those family members, particularly here in this passage, family members in Christ, that they would be not just surviving, but doing well. I think that coming to this section of scripture, we sense that in the church family certainly today. Uh, if there was ever a time in our church family where we desired to be together, um, it would be at a time like this. It's that backdrop of love, that backdrop of that relationship, of, of feeling like we've been torn apart. Uh, this one is done under persecution. Uh, in Thessalonians, that's the idea. It is persecution that's led to this event. In the church today, it's the coronavirus and this sickness, as we keep calling it, the pandemic, uh, that has affected not just the United States, but the world. And regardless of the circumstance, we feel that separation. It is important to know that in this time, your spiritual well-being still matters. And uh, I'm going to take a moment here to um, address something that I think most of us understand and know. It's an interesting time where we are trying to define in our society what essential services are. And I'm not uh, by any means going to undermine or downplay the idea of essential services. Um, and I understand the context of that today. The context is I look out largely upon an empty room, save for my family and Daniel running the sound booth. As I look at that this morning, I am referenced with the same thing that you are, that we go by stores, and while there are many that are empty, there are some of your big box stores that are still not only uh, operational, and I'm, I'm glad they are, and they're taking appropriate measures, but you're seeing people out in society connecting uh, to go get what they need and take care of their families, and I understand that. We understand the need for the basics of life, um, and those basics we often think of are food, clothing, and shelter, and maybe sometimes we think of them exactly in that order. Number one on the list is food um, over clothing or shelter. As long as I can have the food taken care of, I'll be okay. We have our lists of what we go shop for. We have our lists of what we go look for and and those things are important to us, and we're trying to keep on track of those things and supply for those things. And yes, they're important, and, 
And by the way, I'm going to take a moment here and say a thank you uh, to all of our health care providers. For those that are still not only in the fray, but they are really the front line. All of those providing some kind of a uh, health care essential or providing for the health care of people. You're seeing people whether they're, well, really you're seeing people when they're sick. And uh, you're being exposed to a lot of things. And, and yet you're enduring and continue to pri provide that service. And just, you know, what great thanks we have for people that are, are doing that kind of thing. And, and I don't know that we can thank them enough. As we reflect, though, of essential services, I think all of us know that we don't think of the Lord as a service, but we do know that essential to each one of us is our relationship with the Lord who carries us through this. I'm going to say that of all things that are essential, he is the most essential. And I would say the gathering of God's people is most essential as well. And uh, we recognize that we're constraining ourselves at this time uh, to provide for that uh, safety of our community, safety of our people. We recognize that this is for a time and for a season. And uh, in that, I just want to underscore for us that are joining online, as well as those few here this morning, that it is essential that we continue to fellowship with our Lord and to seek him and to make him the utmost priority in your life. Do not let yourself be deceived during this time that Satan wouldn't use this opportunity to not only damage you in your walk with God, but damage the gospel and the church as a whole. To that end, I know it's a, a material kind of thing, and uh, I'm certainly not saying this because I'm trying to emphasize it. I'm just going to emphasize it because I'm going to emphasize you. Um, a blessing to me is that uh, right now the church can't send letters or things to the church, so physical address, so they're sending them to my house. And even in the midst of all that's going on with the coronavirus, uh, many of you have been faithful to remember the Lord in your giving, and I really believe it's the Lord who does that. You're, you're <clears throat> reflecting that he's providing for you, <clears throat> that <clears throat> excuse me, that in the midst of all this that God is providing for you and you're remembering to be thankful for his provision. And, and I think it's a wonderful testimony on your behalf. Uh, but I also just want to say that through this time, we're reflecting over the fact that God does take care of each of our needs day in and day out. And to underscore, he is essential and essential to our walk right now. So as we come to this passage, you find that reflected in the next verse. Now God himself and our Father, verse 11, and our Lord Jesus Christ direct our way unto you. Now God himself and our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ direct our way unto you. The idea here is that there is hope in the midst of what the Thessalonians are dealing with as they are looking <clears throat> to the Lord to be their provider and to be the one who is actually directing in their lives. Let me just encourage you with this. Uh, in talking with the church family throughout this time, one of the things that is beginning to become a continual drip, uh, a continual, uh, I don't know if you want to call it an irritation, but maybe something that you want to just get past, I think most of us, would like to be in a place where we're not referencing or being impacted by this sickness any longer. We would love to be done with it and on the other side. But in this time, if you're going to find encouragement, <clears throat> I'm going to tell you, you're going to be hard-pressed to find that encouragement by, you know, watching on Facebook at all the different news stories coming out and, and trying to sort out who's telling the truth and who isn't. Um, there's even now uh, the huge wave of conspiracy stuff as well, and, and it just gets exhausting. It gets, <clears throat> it gets exhausting trying to sort it out. If you're going to find encouragement today, the way you're going to find encouragement is in verse 11 by remembering you and I absolutely have to be clinging to the Lord and knowing that God in his sovereign hand has not lost track 
of what's going on in the society around us and in the events of our day. So Paul has reiterated several times that his desire is to be with them and the Thessalonians as well to remember Paul, Savannah, and Timothy. Well, as we look at this, he says God is the one who's directing that. So God is directing our way. How long must we continue in this kind of a fashion? Um, you know, there are all kinds of predictions of when we'll be past this and be able to come back together. And I think really for many, we're observing, but it's a guessing game, and we do the best we can. But I want to tell you who does know, and it is the Lord. The Lord knows, and in this passage, he says, Now God himself and our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ, identifying the Godhead and that Christ is God as well, He's saying that in that, there's a direction from the Godhead directing our way unto you. So what I want to do for all of us this morning is to encourage us not to be discouraged, even though we are operating in a very unusual form of life today. I want you to not be discouraged knowing that it is God ultimately who's in charge, God ultimately who is directing God ultimately that not only has a plan, but hasn't lost sight of his plan, hasn't misdirected his plan, but is actively engaged in the daily life of human beings on this planet, doing what only God can do, and that is directing and ordering the events of our lives. So I would hope that you would be encouraged in verse 11 that it is the Lord that we can look to that directs our ways. The prayer that he's reflecting over here is that God would direct our way to each other again. Brother Jerry prayed that this morning before he prayed for the offering. Express that very same sentiment, how much we as believers want to be back together. We step into verse 12, and it says, And the Lord make you to increase and abound in love, one toward another and toward all men, even as we do toward you. Now, in the midst of that separation, life is still going on, and it is happening for us as well. And I know that there are people in our church that have some businesses that are struggling. There are people, all of us in our, our individual families are feeling the impact of our day. But I want to remind you that life is still happening. It's different. It feels a little different in this uh, I, I hate just to, I don't want to belittle it, but call it a hiccup of life in the broad scheme of things. As we're working through this, there is still life to be lived. There is still a walk with God that needs to happen. And your spiritual well-being needs to be on the top of your priority list. If we lose sight of that, I would almost guarantee that all of us will quickly go down the road of discouragement. Quickly go down the road of of, of feeling that heaviness of, can we just get past this? Remember that God is still calling us to actively walk with him today, and not just to walk. In this verse, in the separation that Paul is feeling from the Thessalonians, he is turning this to a remembrance of what he wants to happen in their lives, and something you and I are challenged to do as well, and that is this, that the Lord would make us to increase and abound in a specific avenue. And he's going to give us that specific avenue laid out here. And that is to love one another, abound in love one toward another, and toward all men, even as we do toward you. So a few things about verse 12 that are worth noting. He does a double emphasis in verse 12. And the Lord make you to increase... And then he follows that up with to abound. So not just the idea of increasing, that is having more, but also having an abounding beyond that. Matter of fact, if you look at the Greek language behind the word abound, that is to increase, that is to grow. And it is the idea of super abounding. So not just abounding, but super abounding. <clears throat> the idea is to have more than enough. More than enough and left over. Now, what is enough? Well, I like to start my days with coffee. It's often what I start my day with 
Well, I would say almost every day. Uh, I am so spoiled in my family that my uh, family will often make coffee for me uh, first thing in the morning. They will have it often uh, delivered to me, and uh, they're a blessing that way. How much coffee is too much coffee? Uh, I don't know the answer to that. Uh, is there too much? Yes, but I can tell you this. Every time I leave the house, if I have, if it's in the morning, and I walk out with coffee, I will almost always spill it on the way out because I've got it to the point where it is overflowing. And the picture there that I have of this is that it is the Lord who makes that cup of love overflow. And it is to the idea that it would be so full that it does spill over. So when I read this, I often think of my coffee spilling on the ground as I look behind me. And I see the little dribble here or the dribble there. Or the testimony of it on my pant leg as I'm driving to church. Because I wanted to make sure I had enough so I didn't fill it just, just a little bit. I filled it too much so that there was more than enough than I needed, so that it overflowed. Now, it's interesting that this is how the book of Thessalonians began. If you look back at 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 and look at verse 3, you see this, remembering without ceasing your work of faith and labor of love. It goes on to say, in patience, hope, patient hope of our, in our Lord Jesus Christ, in the sight of God and our Father. This idea of love is mentioned five times in Thessalonians. Five times it's given, one almost in every chapter. It's not mentioned in chapter 2, but in chapter 2 you can't help but read it over and over again where Paul takes great pains in chapter 2 to talk about how he wanted to be with them and how he did express his love for them and his desire to be around them. So it is certainly a theme in Thessalonians, but the reason I say it is because as we come to this passage, you have here this idea of a church who was already loving, that he wanted to grow in their love more. Now, what I'm going to say about that, and I know that we're separated from each other right now, and uh, we are not interacting on a weekly basis by coming together, <clears throat> but I wanna, what I want to reference is that this love that we know that God says we're to have for each other is to continue to grow and grow and grow. And it's one of those aspects in our Christian behavior where God does not give a limit where it can't grow more. And it's also one of those areas where you can't say, well, I've, I've had enough, I don't want it anymore, or I don't need to do it anymore. Matter of fact, it seems to be the language of the Bible that our growing in love will continue to grow until we get to glory. So it becomes a, a message. Matter of fact, I'll steal from chapter 4 for just a moment. So I've referenced First Thessalonians 1 verse 3. We're in verse 12. But look over next chapter <clears throat> to chapter 4 and verse 9. It says, but as touching brotherly love... Ye need not that I write unto you, for ye yourselves are taught of God to love one another. Well, let me ask you, if he doesn't need to write to them about this, why does he do it? If he doesn't need to write to them about it, why does he do it? Well, he does it, I think, to underscore again this truth. You and I cannot love each other enough. It's an attribute for believers that simply cannot be outdone. It has this sense, as we've already noted, of overflowing. Now, not isolated, by the way, to the Thessalonians. You don't need to turn there, but I'll reference for you. Paul said the same thing to the Philippians as well. In chapter 1, verse 9, this is what he said. This I pray, that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in all judgment. It gives some specific avenues how the love was to be applied in knowledge and in all judgment. But you have this idea again. How much are you supposed to love? As much as you can. And if I'm going to say it biblically, I think I would say and more. As much as you can and more. Now it has two targets in this chapter. 
And the Lord make you to increase and to abound or superabound. How? In love one toward another. These are the targets. John 13, 34, and 35, we've already referenced before. I'll read them to you. It says, A new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if you have love one to another. We've referenced that passage in our past history of walking through Thessalonians. This is the attribute. That is, king of the hill, when we look at how believers treat each other. There is not to be any slighting of love towards each other. Again, I know we're separated, but I'm going to reference in your mind those times in your life or those times in church history where people are at odds one with another. And two things are true when that happens. Number one... Our eyes are not on the Lord himself, as we began in verse 11. Now, God himself and our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So God is not in view. And secondly, what also is not being displayed is our love for each other. So, whenever we have those times of being upset or out of, out of touch with each, with each other, at some point, we might say we love each other, but we've lost the application of it. And that simply cannot be done. As believers, we have to tenaciously hold on to loving each other. Secondly, it goes on to say that we love, uh, increase and abound in love toward one another and toward all men. And simply to say this, there is a special bond that believers have one with another. But the scriptures are also clear that we are absolutely to love the lost. We are to love the lost. And I think we need to remember that. And we need to actuate that life or that belief in behavior. And somehow loving those that aren't of the faith. Those who haven't come to Christ. Those who are maybe still searching. And I'm going to tell you, this is one of the, I was thinking about this recently. It, it certainly was not paramount in my life when I got saved. In understanding that the way that I needed to show my family that I, uh, my love of the Lord was to love them. Matter of fact, much of my early Christianity was trying to show my family that I love the Lord by, by what I would and wouldn't do. By my behavior of what I would allow in my life and what I wouldn't. Now, to be fair, I really was doing much of that because I wanted to honor the Lord but I was overemphasizing in my life that my family would see that by what I allowed in my life and wouldn't. Now, that's not, uh, that's not a wrong application, but it is, it is out of balance. The way that we really demonstrate the Lord is by how or is how we love other people around us. Now, how does that look? <clears throat> I'm simply going to ask you, to look to the Lord to show you how you can uh, exemplify that in your life. Now, why do we say that? Or why do I say that? Verse 12 says it this way. And the Lord make you to increase and abound in love one toward another and toward all men. And at the end of that, there's this comma that says, even as we do toward you. Now, there's no getting around this that many times we have a higher expectation of others than we do ourselves. Matter of fact, we will often blame our misbehavior on the behavior of others. We will justify our misbehavior on the behavior of others. Well, I would love them if they would just act right. I would love them if they would just perform to the level of my expectation. By the way, I, again, I don't know how how you reference this in your life. But one of the things that I find difficult for me is that sometimes I will hold people to an expectation that I've never said to them. I will hold people to an expectation that I have in my mind that I've never verbalized. So that's one deficiency. But really the greater deficiency is that we will hold people to a standard of, of love or whatever it may be different from what we would own ourselves. Paul is simply emphasizing in verse 12 
that he is living that behavior to the Thessalonians and he's calling them to do the same. In short, what it means is each one of us has to do this for ourselves, no matter what everybody else in the world around you may do. No matter what everybody else may say or how everybody else may behave. And let me ask you, are you very judgmental? Are you very uh, quick, uh, quick to uh, hold people to a standard and to look down upon them when they don't hold your standard? So I'm going to tell you the weakness of my flesh. Um, I was at one of the big box stores, uh, and as I was there, uh, they had put out toilet paper, and I know you're sick of hearing about it. Uh, I frankly I am too. Uh, but it said on the sign, uh, reserve one per family or one package per family. And I saw others in the store uh, having more than one. And a part of me wanted to be irritated uh, that that's kind of what we've got going on. And I just remember, I just need to come back to this. You know, love people. We are a sin-sick people. We are not uh, better than anybody else. Uh, we just need to love people. And that's the admonition that Paul gives as he's focusing on the Lord missing the brothers and sisters in Christ and reminding them even in this time of missing each other, they still need to grow and the application of which is to love brothers and sisters in Christ and to love the lost and he says, by our example. And that calls us to be that example no matter what anybody else around us might be doing. Now, before I leave verse 12, I just want to close out by saying we need to pray about what that looks like. We need to pray about how we can demonstrate that love to others around us. And I don't think that because we're separated physically uh, in a way that we do not like, that it means that we cannot take time to do this. So somehow, some way, as God directs you, not Pastor Phil or the deacons or your Sunday school teachers, but you simply ask God, how can I show the love of Christ to those around me today? And my prayer, if I can join along with Paul, not only for you, but for myself, is that we would abound more and more. Now, it's not the end. We come to this last verse, verse 13, where he says, to the end, may I say it this way, to this end. Now, an interesting thing before I read the rest of the chapter, this last verse. When he tells us these admonitions about growing in love one toward another, it seems like everything has street signs pointing towards this one avenue. We would, we would know that the Lord is directing our paths, directing our hearts. We anchor in that. Know that he wants us to grow in our love one toward another. But listen how he says it in verse 13. To the end. In other words, there's a location at the end of this, of this path. To the end, that he may establish or establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before God, even our Father, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. Now, there is a lot going on in this last verse. I'll remind you that the overall theme for Thessalonians is, Grounded, growing, and glory. One of the reasons is not simply that that theme is reiterated, but at the end of every chapter, there seems to be this pointing to the future, pointing to what is going to happen in our future. We'll come to that in just a moment. But the end, what Paul is really driving at is for the individual life to be established in their walk with God. Matter of fact, if you'll look back at verse 8, he says, For now we live if you do what? For now we live if you stand fast in the Lord. Now we've already covered that verse. But the idea here is that you and I would be concrete in our following of the Lord. You go back to verse 2. 
And he sent Timotheus, our brother and minister of God and our fellow laborer in the gospel of Christ, to do what? To establish you and to comfort you concerning your faith. There is this desire in Paul, certainly throughout this chapter and throughout this epistle, that God's people individually would stand strong. That each one of you, in your following the Lord, will stand without moving. So what is the goal? The goal is to establish your hearts, to establish you, to cause you to stand fast. And that stand fast is the idea of setting something fast so that it is immovable. It is the idea of driving somebody to a place of resolution. The idea here is that there is a decision that has to be made about your growth and walk with God. So here's what I want to say. If you are not committed to growing in your life and growing in your fellowship with the Lord, if you have not made that decision, then you have made another decision. That something else will be God of your life. Something else will be your passion. Something else will be the driving focus of your life. And there will always be things that come up to drive you. I'm going to tell you that's true in my life. So when I was a young man, I was committed to the Lord at least I believed I was, but there were various things that came up in my life that were very, and most certainly things, that would take my attention away from the Lord and be the most important thing in my life. Any guesses about what some things like that might be? And by the way, as you look through your life, can you answer for yourself, what have been those passions and those things in your life that have caused you to have a resolve that that's what you're going to seek after? Well, for me, I'm sure there are many, but there are two that uh, are heavy in my mind. One is when I was a young man uh, graduating from college, uh, I will just simply say uh, I had a desire to be married. And I have a great sympathy today for young people in that phase of life where you're wondering if God has somebody for you, and who might that be, and how might that go? And, and uh, I know that that's a great question, and certainly an important question to answer. For me, it was out of hand. <clears throat> for me, I was out of line. It became the most important thing to me. And I would just simply say it this way. In my Christian life, it was over that issue, but that really became the darkest chapter in my Christian life. It is where I made the most mistakes spiritually. And it is not, I often say this, but it's not spiritual rocket science. What happened is those things or that thing, finding a wife, became so big to me that God, even though I was looking to him, he became more secondary. And while I was praying for God to show me who it might be and where she might be, the way I sensed it in my life is that I wasn't stab established or being strengthened in the Lord at that time. I made this idea the big thing in my life. And I will simply say that God in his grace broke and humbled me, especially during that time. And I will sadly say it was a time of life where others were hurt in the process. Why? Why? Well, because God was not first place. I'm going to, if you'll bear with me, I want to give you one other illustration. So, uh, and again, for, um, forgive the old sports uh, person in me. But when I was in college, uh, I was greatly pursuing wrestling uh, because I had an opportunity to be in a place where I could really grow in that area. <clears throat> now, I had committed myself <clears throat> to be a preacher, I'd committed myself to go into ministry, but because I was, in my mind, doing well in my wrestling, God had blessed in my wrestling, and I was um, seeing good things happen, and it was during that time that I began to play with the idea, well, maybe the Lord doesn't want me in full-time ministry as a preacher, maybe he just uh, would be pleased to use me as a coach. Now, by the way, there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, if that's what God has for you, that's what God has for you. 
But somehow in all of that, <clears throat> in my life, <clears throat> excuse me, I began to get off track. And I began to let wrestling dominate my life. And while many would not see this as a blessing, uh, it was during that time my freshman year, I forget exactly when it happened, but in a particular wrestling match, I snapped my ligament and my left leg, and it took me out of wrestling for the rest of the year, and it completely changed how I wrestled, and it completely changed the direction that I was going in wrestling, and what it did is it got my focus back on being what the Lord had called me to be. Now, I don't know what it is for you, but God wants you to be grounded, to be set in your relationship with him so that you will not be moved, so that you will not be moved by others, peers or friends or uh, that you might meet uh, along the way, a new wind of doctrine that takes you a different direction. God wants you to be grounded. And here's the point. If you're not grounded, you cannot ground anyone else either. If you're not grounded in your walk with God, you certainly will not disciple others well either. So the call is in this verse, to the end he may establish. Now he, he identifies here your hearts. The reason heart is used is that while God uses your head, metaphorically or as an example, when God speaks to heart in the Bible, he is speaking to what he often references, that seat of decision making, where there is not just a decision, which I would say is of the head, but there's feeling behind it. So often he references the heart. So it's not, it's not that the God, God doesn't... Uh, <clears throat> excuse me, it's not that God is trying to differentiate head knowledge versus heart knowledge. He's simply saying that when there's a decision, that there is emotion behind it, that there is passion behind it. And so <clears throat> the establishment that he is saying is an establishment of your heart, and here's the avenue in which it goes. To the end, he may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before God. Establish your hearts unblameable <clears throat> in holiness before God. Now, here's, here's the point, folks. You've got one life to live. And let me ask you, are you going to be tempted to be drawn away from your walk with God? Are you? Are you going to be tempted to be drawn away from your walk with God? Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, by the way, when that temptation comes, what will be used? Well, according to the book of James uh, and many other passages, it will be our desires that will be used to draw us away from the Lord. Now, it doesn't mean you shouldn't have any desires. It doesn't mean you shouldn't be passionate about things. But you need to remember to whom you belong. You need to remember who is the core of your life and who gave you life, and what your life is really about. <clears throat> so what your life is, is about as a believer, according to the scriptures, is Jesus Christ. That's who your life is about. It is because of him that you have everlasting life. And by the way, what's the end of this journey? The end of this journey, can, can you join me in this? When I, when I ask you, where are you going to be when you die? <clears throat> How would you answer that? How would you answer where are you going to be when you die? Well, many of us, many of us would say heaven. And that's, that's a good answer. Really, the ultimate end of your life is not a place, but a person. Your life is made as a believer to be enjoined together with Christ. That's what your life is made for. So we miss getting together with each other because as believers we share a bond in Christ. We love each other. But you realize that's just a shadow. 
It's, a, it's, a, it's important, it's big, but it's not comparable to our union with Christ. Our relationship with him is this, when we die, we are going to him. You remember the passage, right? The Lord said he goes and he goes to prepare a place for us. Why? That where he is, we may be also. So my point is this. The Lord has made you to be in fellowship with him. That is the ultimate end of this target. The important thing that we see in this passage now is that God does not want us to wait until that moment that we leave this world that we're concerned about our fellowship with him. It is ideally what he says here in our discipleship and growth is that our walk with him matters so much now that it affects how we live now. And it affects us this way. To the end that we, he may establish or establish your hearts unblameable in a particular area, unblameable in holiness before God. <clears throat> now what this means is, first of all, a doctrine to know, is that we are positionally holy in Christ. Christ has already made us completely holy because of the righteousness of Christ and knowing him as our Savior. Our sins have been washed. We are unspotted and, uh, and clean every whit, as the Bible would say, and ready to be presented before the Lord. However, there is a practical holiness that's being spoken of here, not our positional holiness. That practical holiness is as we're walking through this world that we would be unspotted, unblameable in holiness. And I'm going to tell you, there's only one way that really happens. Unblameable in holiness only comes from people who actually care about a relationship with Christ. That's the only way it happens. You don't naturally live a holy life. You don't naturally live an unblameable life. That doesn't happen in the heart of the natural man. It happens as you surrender to be in fellowship with God. The point of this passage is that the Lord is driving you to make a decision in your life to concrete yourself in your relationship with the Lord so that nothing will move you away from that. The challenge here is to know that there are going to be many things in your life that are going to try to draw you away, draw you away, draw you away from the Lord. I'll remind you of a passage about practical holiness as you'll turn to your right and go to the almost the end of your Bible to 1 Peter chapter 1. They're two of my favorite verses when it talks about holiness. It's 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 15 and 16. <clears throat> I'm going to read verse 14, and I could back up further and further. It's hard not to back up, you know. Um, we'll just start in verse 14. It says, as obedient, 1 Peter 1, verse 14, as obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former, what? Lusts in your ignorance. And it's the Holy Spirit who's enlightened your mind. It's the word of God that's enlightened your mind to tell you the will of God. Now you know that your life is not to be lived for the lusts that you had in the past. Instead, in verses 15 and 16, but as he which has called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. Of course, we understand the word conversation to mean behavior of life or lifestyle or the way in which you live out your life. And it gives you an underscore here because it is written, be ye holy. How does it say it? For I am holy. Why does that matter? Be ye holy for I am holy. Why, why would the Lord even say that? Well, he says that because your life as a believer is based on a relationship with him. That holiness in your life isn't this fever pitch of working up something you can't do. Holiness 
if you really want to know the best definition of holiness, holiness is mirroring the reflection of God. And that naturally happens when you spend time with Him and you love Him and you're pursuing Him. So we come back to our passage <clears throat> that He would establish our hearts unblameable in holiness before God, even our Father. Now, I'm going to close. Our time is up. But it says here, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. So the point of the passage at the end, when we think about this series title, Grounded, Growing, and Glory, the Lord is good to remind us again and again and again that this is not all there is in this world. What you're going through right now is not all there is. Matter of fact, the Bible and many different language types or illustration types tells us that this life is not all there is. Probably one of the most famous that we think of is our life is but a vapor that appears for a little time and then does what? It vanishes away. In Matthew chapters 5 and 6, we think about all the illustrations of things that pass away, uh, of our clothes, our material goods, our monies, they all pass away. And the admonition there is to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. So here's what I want to encourage you with. This time of life <clears throat> tells us of the fragility of life, how fragile life is, how temporary this life is. You have a decision and you have one shot at this life. As a believer, make sure that we're established on why we're living this life. And I know there's a lot of concerns. Is it true that some of your businesses may be in jeopardy? Yes. Is it true that the giving of the church could be affected and it could affect Fellowship Baptist Church? Yes. I don't know what's going to happen materially in this world. And I'm going to say that we're responsible just to trust God with what God is going to do. But I will say this, no matter what the circumstances of life may be, my calling in Christ and your calling in Christ is sure. We're to be established and settled in knowing this. My life belongs to him and I want to live it unblameably and wholly separated unto him and apart from the world so that my life reflects I belong to Jesus. Is that true? Can that settle your heart in peace this morning? Can it settle your heart in peace in this coming week? I, I, now, again, I don't want to be an alarmist, and I don't know. I, I, again, I'm listening and paying attention, okay? But am I right? I don't know. You pray about it with me and sort it out with me. Stories of the day are, if there is a growing tide of watching what's happened before, and looking at what may happen to us now as a nation, arguably, from what we've been seeing in reports, these next two weeks are the greatest hit in the two weeks uh, since the onset of the coronavirus. What does that mean? <clears throat> I don't know. Has it already affected the stock market? Yes. But I'm going to drive you just to simple truths. Is God bigger than the stock market? Is God bigger than, you know, what's going to happen with my food tomorrow? What's going to happen with my power bill? What's going to happen with my... Listen, we can fret over all of this stuff. And I know that some of it takes our attention. We have to exercise due diligence to, to go shop or buy or take care of our needs. But, but, you know, we just need to remember that there's a God who's in charge and a God to whom we're going. And the promise of this passage is that we're either going to him, but this passage reflects it this way, he's coming again for us, where it says, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. Now, theologians argue over this because another passage refers to this in Matthew, saying that the Lord's going to come back with his angels. This one says saints. Many scholars and I would agree that when the Lord comes back, it seems pretty clear to me that the Lord, when he comes back, is going to come with those who have died in Christ before. 
and he's going to come with the resurrected saints. He's coming with those, and there is going to be a resurrection, and, and we're all going to meet him together in the air. <clears throat> I don't mean to be too muddy about that. I just simply mean to say this. He's coming for us. And the underscoring of that truth is there is coming a day where the reality of this truth is going to be seen. And if you want to talk about an event that's going to affect the world, it's that event. If you want to talk about an event for us that is hope-filled and encouraged, are you encouraged with the idea that you will be with your Savior? Are you encouraged with the idea that there is not going to be any more sickness, sorrow, pain, or death in heaven? Well, this is what the Lord has promised his children. It is to him that we go. So this morning as we close, I just want to establish all of our hearts and to understand to establish our hearts is a decision this morning. Are you going to live this life at peace knowing that the Lord is your focus He's your reason for living, and it is to him that you go. And what happens in this short journey below, he can be trusted with. He can be trusted to sort out. So this morning, I hope you will make a decision to be established in your heart, that you will live a life unblameable in holiness before God, that you will love him supremely. And with that, we close.